This morning I want to talk about a mom's job. You ever hear this one? A mother's work is never done. I saw somewhere a job description about a mom. Just kind of want to read it. It says in this job description, it says, This is a permanent job. Two, the successful applicant must be prepared to work hard. Do you all agree? Yeah. Y'all, you live out there? <laughs> Three, the workplace is often a challenging and chaotic environment. Wow. You guys are just... You must be comatose from being a mother this weekend. Four, applicants must possess excellent communication and organizational skills and be willing to work variable hours, which will include evenings and weekends and frequent 24-hour shifts on call. Five, extensive chauffeuring duties also required, Crystal. But your travel expenses will not usually be reimbursed. Six, Some overnight travel will be required, including trips to camping sites on rainy weekends and countless sports tournaments in far away places. Seven, must be willing to be hated, at least temporarily, until someone needs five bucks. (laughs) Must be willing to bite tongue repeatedly. Nine, must possess the physical stamina of a pack mule and be able to go from zero to 60 miles per hour in three seconds flat in case this time the screams from the backyard are genuine and not just someone crying wolf or plane. (laughs) 10. Must be willing to face stimulating technical challenges such as small gadget repair, mysteriously sluggish toilets, and stuck zippers. 11. Must screen phone calls, maintain calendars, and coordinate production of multiple homework projects. 12. Must have ability to plan and organize social gatherings for clients of all ages and mental outlooks. 13. Must be willing to be indispensable one minute and an embarrassment the next. Come on. (laughs) 14. Health and safety. Must be able to handle the assembly and product safety testing of hundreds of toys and battery operated devices. 15. Regarding your attitude and demeanor. Must always hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. Must assume final, complete accountability for the quality of the end product. 16. Responsibilities also include floor maintenance, laundering, and janitorial work throughout the place of employment. 17. Promotion prospects. None. Your job is to remain in the same position for years without complaining, constantly retraining and updating your skills so that those in your charge can ultimately surpass you. 18. Previous experience. None required because no other form of employment is totally relevant, but on-the-job in-service training is offered on a continually exhausting basis. 19. Wages and bonuses. None. Job satisfaction is what you hopefully receive. 20. Outlays. You pay every bill for your child at least until they turn 18 because of the assumption that college will help them become financially independent. When you die, you give them whatever is left. And the strangest thing about this reverse salary scheme is that you should enjoy it and wish you could only do more. 21. Benefits. While no health or dental insurance, no pension, no tuition reimbursement, no paid holidays, and no bonuses are offered, this job supplies limitless opportunities for free hugs for life if you play your cards right. (laughs) Tenure for the rest of your life. Mothers, we know. It's not... We know, needless to say, motherhood is not an easy job. And let's face it, dads, fatherhood is generally easier than motherhood. They take so much of that work and that responsibility on moms, have for generations sacrificed their own needs, they have prayed, they have worked themselves to the bone, and they have loved like no other loves. But this morning I want to look at a few things that should be in every mother's job description, a few things that moms can always make sure that they're doing to do well, a few things that we find in Scripture from one mom that we see in the Word of God. So I'm going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. It's the story of Hannah and her son Samuel. It says, Now there was a certain man of Ramethim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Roham, the son of Eliuhu, 
the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. We all needed to know that part, right? And he had two wives. I'm just telling you know, sister wives don't work. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him from the Lord. I want us to glean a few thoughts from Hannah this morning. And I will be quick because I know that there are lunch reservations and other things going on today. The first thing I want us to glean is that godly moms pray. Godly moms pray. Here we have this woman, and she was in a hopeless situation. Some of you moms out there, you understand what hopeless situations feel like. Some of you have been in those hopeless places. You weren't sure how to put food on your table. You weren't sure what to do when your child was sick. You weren't sure how to help them get through problems maybe in school or their education. Some of you as adults have children that you feel are in hopeless situations and you're concerned about your kids. I want you to know there is always hope. Amen? Amen. There is always hope. And in the day that Hannah lived, many people went and they carried out religious duty. In fact, the very sons of the priest Eli, they were not, even though they were fellow priests, they were not real in the relationship with God and they were just going through the actions. The Bible tells us they were very sinful men. But we see Hannah coming, and in desperation, she pours out her heart at the altar of God. She pours out her heart at the foot, at the steps of the tabernacle, and cries out to God in her desperation for a child. I know some of you moms have been in those places where you have cried out in desperation to God. You know, never underestimate the power of a praying mother. Amen? And moms, I want to encourage you, never stop praying. For your kids. Because let me tell you, even the older your kids get, probably the more you need to be praying. I remember hearing the story. My grandmother, she was not raised. um, She was raised as a Catholic. She wasn't raised uh, more ritual than in relationship with Jesus. And I remember she came to the Lord one day. She had started going to a Bible study. And this 
crazy Pentecostal group, and all her friends made fun of her. And, and the, the pastor of that group, and it was an Italian group of people, they were all Italian immigrants in this country. One of her kids got sick, and the pastor came over, and the doctors didn't have anything else to do for him, didn't know if he was going to make it through the day. The pastor came over, prayed for him. He was healed that day, and from that day forward, my grandmother served the Lord all of her life, knowing the power that she saw in God. Well, out of her ten children... Four or five of them were in World War II at the same time. In fact, I have an uncle who was the second one. He was a paratrooper at Normandy. He was the second one to jump from the plane and to fight the way going through the troops. And the stories of my grandmother that I heard her pastor at that time um, told these stories one day when he was visiting a church that I was an associate pastor in. During that time, she would get down on her knees and she would pray and she would pray for hours. Having four kids in war at the same time is not a fun thing. And she would pray for hours over her sons who were in battle. And, when, and she, after she would pray for hours, she would get up and just go on her duty because she had known that when God released her to stop praying, she knew that everything would be okay. My grandmother had every one of her kids come home from the war. Every one of them living, every one, none of them injured, all of them coming home. I know that same power of prayer when you feel hopeless. I remember the day that my wife found out that our son had joined the Marines. Not too happy about having her baby boy join off to the Marines. And our son, though, his ASVAB scores were as high. He could have picked any job he wanted. He wanted to go into battle, so he chose combat support. Just what every mother wants to hear. You know, <laughs> Marine and combat support. And my wife began praying from the day that he enrolled, before he ever actually went in, that he would never see war-torn soil. Well, she kind of was frustrated when they deployed him because he was going out not only to what was known as war-torn soil, but he was going to Helmand's province in Afghanistan, which was the worst part of the Afghanistan war. It was the most bloodiest, where the most bloodiest battles had taken place. It was where the most lives from Americans have been lost. And yet my wife prayed, and I saw her pray daily and pray over my son. He didn't tell us. We thought he was driving the truck, and he told us that they were more reconnaissance. They were starting to close down bases, trying to ease our minds. But what he didn't tell us was that he was the gunman on the top of the tank. Most vulnerable, most open for injury. And after his six-month deployment, about three or four months in, we had this great news. You see, a general had come to the troops there at Helen Province and said, we don't get it. You call deployed at the beginning of fighting season. And we've never seen anything like this before. But there has been no battle in the four months that you have been here. Wow. We've never seen not having battle during this time of year with these, with these people and with these, this, in this region. It's just never happened. So we're sending you all home early. And within a week or so after my son arrived back home on American soil, a Marine in Helmand Province doing his job at the top of a truck was killed. You know, makes you realize that prayer works. My son was actually upset. I didn't get to see battle. He was bothered by that. He was considering re-enlisting until I looked at him and said, don't you dare do that to your mother again. And you know she's just going to pray and you're still not going to see battle. So if you don't like seeing the Marines, just get out now. Prayer works. Godly moms pray. Godly moms also live an example. Let me read a little bit more in that story. 1 Samuel one twenty two. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned. Then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. So Hannah stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Sorry, I repeated the verse in my notes. Which was about three years of age in that day. And I know that some of you are saying, well, that wasn't very long to impact his life. But I want to let you know something. Hannah was going to have to give up her child because she made a promise to God. Let me tell you, moms, when you promise God something, you need to follow through on it. Don't promise God to do something if he does something with your children and then not follow through. But the one thing that we see in Hannah's life is that she was a godly example. She was a godly example. She was an example of obedience. 
If nothing else, Samuel would always know that he was brought to that temple at the age of three. A child that his mother had prayed for, had desperately longed for. But her mother, his mother, in wanting to be an example of obedience before God, she brought him to the temple and gave him to the work of God for his life. Now, Samuel went on. We know we, he went on to be a prophet and a priest over Israel. One of the most powerful prophets and priests that we will ever see over the nation of Israel. Because he was a prophet and priest before they had kings. He would anoint the first two kings of Israel. God would use him to choose who those first king, two kings would be. And God at a young age when he was only about eight or nine. God would begin speaking into Samuel. He would begin speaking his word and bringing messages to the people of Israel through this young boy. That would not have happened if his mother had not lived out the example of obedience before her son. That would not have happened had he not seen his mother showing obedience to God. You see, moms, I know that you love your children. But let me tell you something. Love is not enough. You hear what I'm saying? Sometimes we love our children so much that we try and remove consequences from their life. We love our children so much that we try and keep them from experiencing discipline and punishment. We might try and keep them from experiencing the pains of life. When we really need to, what we need to do is let them go up through those and point to them the direction of what God's Word says so they learn what it is to be a godly example. And moms, as you live out that godly example before your children, your life will have greater impact on them than even your loved ones. Because they will remember what they saw their mom do. They will remember how they saw their mom live her life. George Washington, our first president, said, I am what I am because of my mother. And there was a preacher, G. Campbell Morgan. He had four sons. They all became ministers as well. At a family reunion, a friend asked one of the sons, he said, So which Morgan is the greatest preacher? And one of the sons quickly responded, Our mother. Because it was the mom who continued to bring that word to her children. The mom who continued to impact them. And the mom who lived a life of obedience before them. I'm not saying that the father didn't, but the mom had a louder voice in the situation. You know, moms, you preach sermons through your actions. You preach sermons through your examples. You preach sermons through the things that you do. And you do it so well. Your children will see that commitment that you've made in your life. And they will emulate what they see in you. Don't. Don't, you know, realize that when we see our children as they grow, that often what we see in them that we're so proud of is what we have instilled into them, the values and the obedience to the Lord. You know, my mom was a godly woman. I've not had her for, oh, I'm not even sure how many years it's been right now, maybe, maybe seven. I think about seven, ten, ten years this year. And so, but I remember my mom... She was a great lady. I remember my mom every morning. My dad went to work very early. So my mom would always, you know, she got me off to school. I didn't really see my father much in the morning. Not that my dad wasn't a great dad. But but my mom, she'd go down, she'd make breakfast. And my mom was a working mom. She worked every day from 9 to 5. She worked at a hardware store as a bookkeeper. But every morning before we went off, we'd sit before I went off to school. We'd watch it was the days of PTL. Remember the Praise the Lord Club? So we watched a little PTL while we were eating breakfast. You know, that one egg, one slice of toast, a little glass of orange juice. She was really good about it every day. And then after that, she'd open up the Bible and she'd read it. And then we'd pray together. If there's an impression of my mom and everything she did in my life, that is the impression that I remember the most. It was a good impression. It was a good example. I'm serving the Lord today because of the godly example of my parents and because they lived out obedience in their life. I remember another time in my church when our church was going through some really, my home church was going through some really rough times. There was a lot of division. There was a lot of fighting and battle in the church. I'm so thankful I don't pastor a church like that. But I remember this, and this was in my home church after I had actually left home. I was actually in college at this time. I actually married at this time. And they were going through a lot of battles. And I remember my mom because the gossip circle circled that church like anything. And let me tell you, ladies, I'm thankful we don't have this problem in our church. I haven't seen this one bit since I've been here as pastor. And I'm thankful for that because let me tell you, nothing will destroy a church faster than gossip. And people who get disgruntled and just gripe about it. I'm so thankful for a healthy and wonderful church. But I watched my mother in that situation. She would not, though she had friends, she would never talk about the church. She would never talk about the people's complaints. She would never let anyone complain to her about it. And she refused to talk down about the pastor. 
And I think, you know, when a bunch of Christians were misbehaving, my mom was going to stand there as a godly example of what we should have done. Our examples, how we train our children, will have a great effect on them. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Those are words not just for moms. Those are words for dads. Those are words for kids to hear someday when you're raising your own children. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That doesn't always mean that they won't make mistakes at some point in their life. But I believe that that means that somewhere through their life, because you've planted into their life the seeds of the gospel, because you've shown them that example, you can continue to pray and hope for them to get back on the right path. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Your example has greater impact even than your love. The third thing I want to talk about this morning is that godly moms let go. Godly moms let go. 1 Samuel 24 to 28. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bulls, one ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. And in that moment, Hannah took her little three-year-old, and she gave him over to Jesus. She gave him over to God. We give him over to Jesus today. She gave him over to God. She gave him to the priest to take care of him and to raise him in the tabernacle. As hard, and I cannot imagine a woman who would so desperately pray for a child to be born, but she had made a vow to God that she would give him back to God. She was willing to bring him back and to let him go. Now moms, most of you are so blessed that you don't have to let go of your children at three years of age. Maybe a few of you with three-year-olds wouldn't mind letting go of your children at three years of age. But you're so blessed that you get to hang on to them. But moms, and some of you older moms understand this, no matter what, there is going to come a day where you're going to have to let go of your children. Some moms don't like to let go. Some moms don't like having to release their children. But whether it's because of marriage or career, even if it's because sometimes it happens from death, we will one day have to let our children go. I didn't like it when my son first went off to college. It devastated me. I wasn't a mom, I was a dad. But I struggled with that. I start struggling even now with the thought of my last one going off in a few years. But moms, you've had 18 years to wean and nurture your children in the things of God. Some of you might be joyous when you let them go. Some of you might be terrified. You might not like the challenge. Nevertheless, that moment will come where you will have to release them. But it's in that time that you've had them that you can release them knowing that what you have put into their lives will make a difference. Now is the time that counts if your kids are at home. I'm not saying that when your kids are grown that you don't continue to instill things in their lives, that you don't continue to pray for your children because you do sometimes, like I said, all the more. But let me tell you, moms, now is the time if you've got kids at home to instill the choices that they make, to speak into their lives, to be that example, to show them where they have to go because one day you're going to have to trust what you did will be enough so you can let them go to find their own path and to make their own decisions for Jesus. You can't make your kid get to heaven. But what you do in your child's life now, and can I just say something to moms and dads alike? If your kid's at home living under your roof, you tell them when they go to church. You make the decisions. You tell them where they go and don't go. You're the parent. I'm telling you right now, this society has gotten off on this kick of almost, you know, kids turn 12 or 13 and parents start letting them make their own choices. Baloney. You're still their parent. You still need to give them godly instruction and direction. And they might despise you for it. I read an article this past week about seven traits of of a successful person. And every one of them had to deal with strict parents who watched over their kids' phones, who knew where their kids were going, who insisted on curfews, who actually punished and disciplined their kids. Let me tell you, when you do that with your kids, you're going to make a powerful effect. If all you're doing is indulging your children, you're going to have some trouble later on. So do that thing and know when that time to come to let them go comes, you can let them go with confidence that God will do what he needs to do in their lives. It wasn't always easy. 
letting go of our first one. It wasn't always easy. Didn't always like some of the choices he might have made when he was learning to fly on his own. But you know what? After all was said and done, he landed right where he needed to. Serving Jesus, ministering as a pastor in the church, as an associate pastor in the church, and serving the Lord with his life. So in conclusion, motherhood is probably the greatest job assignment. The world might tell you to be successful in a career, but moms, you know that what you do in your home as your mother, you know that's the toughest job you've ever had, but it's also the best job you've ever had. And you are successful at what you do. It is the greatest assignment ever granted to a woman. Don't let our world demean what your motherhood means. You have had the power to help and shape a next generation. What you do in them makes a difference. The power of your prayer over their lives, the power of your example before them, and the power of your being able to trust and release them into God's hands when they come to that age. That's why Samuel was a success. Those things happened, and that's why our kids can be successes as well. And I am believing that if you are not seeing your children where you desire to see them, I know that God is not done. If you have kids that are older or raised and they're not serving Jesus, I know that if you were that example, that God is still not done. Moms, keep on praying. Keep on believing. Where there's life, there's hope. It doesn't stop. Amen? And so keep on praying. Keep on believing and trust that God is going to do what he's promised to do. Would you bow your heads?